Hello everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel Pathology Learning. I am Dr. Monica. So today we will be starting about the new series which is the genetics. So under which the first heading will be the basic terminologies used in genetics and then we will be seeing about the classification of the genetic disorders. Right? So starting with the basic terminologies, we all know the uh, human genome that is the human genetic material is contained in the DNA. So this DNA is going to be a double uh, helix and in this double helix we have various nucleotides. So what composes this nucleotides is that we have certain bases which is cytosine, adenine, thymine and guanine. Right? So these bases are going to be linked with the uh, sugars and phosphate groups to form the nucleotides. Okay, these nucleotides actually they pair up with each other. So adenine always pairs with thymine. So A pairing with T and then C pairing with G. Okay, so this pairing is going to form the backbone of the DNA helix. So these base pairs which are actually formed is going to be composed of approximately 3.2 billion DNA base pairs. So we have around 3.2 billion DNA base pairs in the human genome. So as far as we, uh, we all know that uh, the human chromosomes is going to be 23 pairs of chromosomes. So out of this 23 pairs of chromosomes, out of the pair, one is going to be derived from the mother and the other set is going to be derived from the father. So mother and father together, the eight of them give one copy which forms the 23 pairs of chromosome. So out of this 23 pairs, 22 pairs are going to be composed of the autosomes. While the last pair is going to be the sex chromosome. So sex chromosome could either be XX or XY. So if it is XX, we call it as a female. While if it is an XY, it is a male. Okay, so Y chromosome, it determines the male genetic. Okay, so in this human genome, if you see, we are going to have both coding regions and non-coding regions. So coding regions are the ones which are responsible for producing the proteins. So coding regions are composed of the genes basically. So coding regions and non-coding regions are there. These coding regions are also called as the exons. While the non-coding regions are called as the introns. So believe it or not, this coding regions is going to be composed of only 1.5% of the entire human genome. So rest of the 98.5% is actually composed of this intron which is the non-coding regions. So this coding regions which is actually producing around 20,000 proteins or so. So these ones are coded only in 1.5% of the genome. So this 98.5 rest of the genome which is the non-coding regions or the introns. So what are they actually? So they are actually composed of regions like transposons. So transposons are jumping genes. So they jump from one region to another and they are involved in the regulation of the gene. Apart from that, we have the centromeres and telomeres. So centromere and telomere, these are parts of the human chromosome. Centromere is the central part while the telomere is the end part of the chromosome. Other than that, we have other non-coding RNAs like microRNA and then long non-coding RNA. So a long non-coding RNA, we also call it as link RNA. So these microRNAs and long coding RNAs are very important in the gene regulation. So based on this microRNAs only, it is determined whether a gene expression is going to be there or not. They are usually involved in the silencing of the genes. So these microRNAs and link RNAs are going to be very important. Apart from that, we have promoter regions and enhancer regions. So these promoter and enhancer regions are the regions of the gene to which the uh, transcription factors will attach and uh, only when these uh, transcription factors attach with this promoter and enhancer regions, the transcription of the protein is going to take place. So resulting in the expression of the gene. So these promoter and enhancer regions are as such non-coding regions. So non-coding regions are transposons, promoter enhancer regions, then non-coding RNAs like link RNA and micro RNA apart from that centromeres and telomeres are there. Okay. So exons and introns are important. So moving on, so we have in the human genome, there are various genes which are present. So various contiguous stretches of the DNA segments are going to form uh, various genes. Okay. So a gene, suppose a gene is going to be represented by the letter A. For example, I am telling you, sorry, for example, A. So we have two alleles. So every gene is going to have two copies. 
So two copies are going to be there. So this copy, each copy is going to be derived from uh, 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 two copies, right? So one copy is going to be derived from the mother, another copy is going to be derived from the father. So this copy which we represent, right? So this A, 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 each of these copies are going to be called as alleles, basically, okay? So if you call uh, something as a dominant allele, it means we are going to represent it by the letter capital, okay? So dominant is capital. Well, recessive allele we represent it with a small letter, small a. Okay, so what is this dominant and recessive is that if there is, if an uh, allele is going to be dominant, it is going to express itself, right? So dominance, it is going to show its dominance and whatever it is encoding, it is going to express that kind of a trait. While a recessive allele, it is recessive as the name suggests, it is going to be recessive. So unless it has another recessive allele, it is not going to express itself. So normally it is the dominant allele which expresses, right? So what is homozygosity and heterozygosity? So homo means same. So, so uh, both the alleles are going to be of the same nature. Suppose A, A, both the alleles are, can be a dominant allele or both the alleles can be a recessive allele. Heterozygosity in the other sense it means it is going to be a hybrid combination. That is one of the alleles is going to be uh, uh, dominant while other allele is going to be recessive. So uh, if there is a homozygous kind of a pattern. So that is AA, capital AA. So in this case, it is the dominant expression. So when the genotype, that is the homozygosity is of the dominant allele, it is going to express the dominant allele only. Okay. So dominant, whenever it is present, it is going to express itself. So when both are homozygous, obviously it is going to express the dominant nature only. While both of it is uh, homo, uh, recessive, like in a homozygous state, both of it is recessive. So in that case, it is going to express the recessive trait. Okay, recessive trait is going to be expressed only in the homozygous state. So in this homo heterozygous state, which is a combination of the dom dominant and the recessive allele, in this case, it is the autosomal dominant allele which is going to be expressed. Okay. So what do you infer from this? These are very important. So if I have to put it in simpler words, it means that dominant allele is going to express itself both in the homozygous state and also in the heterozygous state, right? Both heterozygous and homozygous state are going to be expressed by the dominant allele while a recessive allele will be expressed only in a homozygous state. So this is the basic thing in the genetics first. Moving on, let's see co-dominance. There is something called as co-dominance in which both the alleles are going to uh, express themselves in equal amounts. So examples of this co-dominance is human ABO groups, blood groups, ABO blood groups we are saying, right? Then HLA, human leukocyte antigen. Okay, so both of these are examples of co-dominance. When we see what is a genotype and what is a phenotype. So genotype is nothing but the genetic makeup. So whatever we are writing, right, A, 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 A. So this is the genotype, which is the genetic makeup of the person. While phenotype is the physical expression. So whatever this genetic makeup, what is the end result of it? How is it even expressed? So that is going to be the phenotype expression. That is the physical expression is going to be called as the phenotype. So suppose example, Turner syndrome we can take. So Turner syndrome, the genus, a genotype is going to be uh, XO, 45XO. So 45XO is the genotype, while the phenotype is the uh, physical appearance of the patient. So Turner syndrome patient, they are usually uh, short in stature, they have webbed neck, low hairline. So all of these features are called as the phenotypic expression of the patient. Next, we'll see about certain other terms like pleiotrophy. So what is pleiotrophy? Pleiotrophy means that a single gene is going to have multiple effects. So uh, example we can see a sickle cell anemia. So in sickle cell anemia is there is a uh, mutation which is present at a single uh, nucleotide. So a point mutation is there in the sickle cell anemia. So because of this point mutation the patients are going to form a hemoglobin S. So this hemoglobin S in turn is going to have various presentations. So firstly it is going to present with anemia. Secondly, it is going to have lots of infarct formation because of the sickling. So sickling is going to lead to lots of infarcts, end organ damage basically. So infarcts can be seen. Apart from that, you can also have this vasoclusis and then splenic autoinfarcts. 
So there are various presentations of a single gene mutation itself. So a single gene which is being mutated is going to have various effects that is called as pleiotrophy. Next is genetic heterogeneity. So it is the exact opposite of pleiotrophy. Various genes can contribute to a single effect. So again here the example we can take is that of a congenital deafness. So congenital deafness, you can you would have read it in various triads, right? So various causes of gen, um, congenital deafness are there. So meaning various genes are contributing for this congenital deafness. So various genes contributing to a single effect is called as genetic heterogeneity. Then comes penetrance and expressivity. So penetrance is nothing but uh, how far a uh, mutated gene is expressed in a person. So sometimes there will be complete penetrance, meaning if I uh, inherit the gene, definitely I am going to manifest, that is complete penetrance. Then there is incomplete penetrance, which is a feature of a autosomal dominant. So incomplete penetrance is a feature of autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance. In that case, even though I had inherited the mutant gene, I am not going to express the trait. So that is called as incomplete penetrance. Then we have expressivity. So expressivity is if I have received a mutant allele, what are the effects of my mutant allele? So uh, even though there is a single gene which is mutated, various people can express various manifestations. That is called, called as the uh, expressivity. So variable expressivity is actually a feature of the autosomal dominant again. So incomplete penetrance and variable expressivity is the feature of autosomal dominant diseases. So variable expressivity is again example, I will give it a uh, neurofibromatosis. In neurofibromatosis, the gene is going to be the NF1 gene which is mutated. But if NF1 gene is mutated, some people will develop neurofibromas, some people will develop other skin tumors, some people will have bone deformities, while other people will have skin macules, cafe au lait spots. So this kind of variable uh, presentation is going to be there for a, um, a single mutant allele. So that is called as variable expressivity. So these terms are important. So next we will see about the Lyons hypothesis. So Lyons hypothesis, it states that one of the X chromosomes is going to be inactive. So one of the X is going to be inactive and this inactivation is going to happen at a random, uh, okay, so this inactivation is going to happen at a random place. So this random inactivation is going to happen at day 5.5 of the embryo. So as soon as the embryo is formed at day 5.5 itself, this uh, random inactivation of the X is going to happen. And what is uh, beautiful about us is that the X, whatever X is being inactivated, it is going to be the same X which is inactivated throughout the genome. So XX is there. So one of the X is going to be inactivated. The same X is going to be inactivated in all the cells. So how does this inactivation takes place? This inactivation takes place by a DNA methylation actually. So methylation is actually an epigenetic change. We will be reading about epigenetic uh, later on. So just now remember uh, DNA methylation is epigenetic change which is involved in the silencing of the gene. So basically DNA methylation will lead to silencing of the gene expression. So this um, inactivation of the X is going to be controlled by a gene called as the cyst gene. So this cyst gene is actually coding for a long non-coding RNA. If you see this inactivated X, you can see it in the, the microscope. So this in inactivated X is going to appear as a bar body. So bar bodies are the inactivated X. You can visualize it in the nuclear membrane of a neutrophil. So if you see a neutrophil attached to the nuclear membrane, you can have a, something like a drumstick kind of an appearance. So this drumstick appearance is nothing but of a bar body. So that determines the sex of the uh, person that is it is a female. So the rule for bar body is that the number of bar bodies are going to be number of X minus 1. So suppose there is a female. So a normal female is going to have XX uh, genotype, right? So XX meaning 2X are there. So uh, 2X minus 1 is going to be 1 bar body. While in the case of a normal male, he is going to have an XY uh, genotype. So XY in the sense there is only one X and that X is going to be removed. So X minus 1, right? So X minus 1, 1 minus 1 is going to be 0. So males are not going to have any bar body. So that is why I told whenever you see a neutrophil having a bar body, it is actually meaning that it is from a female. Then uh, an example of a Turner syndrome will take. So Turner syndrome, even though it is a female, it is a XO phenotype, uh, genotype. So XO in the sense there is only one X. So number of X minus one is one minus one will be zero bar body again. 
So in turners also you are going to have zero bar body like that of a male. Okay. Then we'll see about the type of chromosome. So the uh, human genome is arranged in the form of chromosomes, right? So this chromosome is going to appear like this. The center part is going to be the centromeres, which is a non-coding region again. And then we are going to have these arms. So we have a small arm and a long arm. So small arm we represented by the letter P, P for petit. Petit in the French means small. So petit and the long arm is going to be called as the Q. Just the letter next to P. So they just took it like that. So P and Q. So uh, uh, the ends of the chromosome are going to be called as the telomeres. Okay, So that is again a non-coding region. So we have various types of chromosome based on the attachment of the centromere. So a metacentric chromosome is one in which the chromosome uh, centromere is at the center. Okay, so both the arms are going to be equal in length, P equal to Q here. Submetacentric is when there is going to be a discrepancy between the arm length. So the centromere is pushed slightly away from the center. So slightly away from the center. So Q is longer than P. Then acrocentric chromosome is when it is going to be more or less near the end. The centromere is going to be more or less near the end of a chromosome. So we are going to have a very long um, Q arm compared to that of a P arm. So uh, more or less at the end of the chromosome. Telocentric is at the end of the chromosome. The centrum is present at the end of the chromosome, meaning there is only Q. There is no P arm at all. So examples of this metacentric chromosomes are chromosome 1. Submetacentric, the example will be chromosome X. While acrocentric, the examples will be chromosome Y, chromosome 14, chromosome 15, chromosome 21, chromosome 22, all these are acrocentric chromosomes. Telocentric chromosomes as such, they are not present in humans. Okay. So next is mutation. So what are mutations? So mutations are abnormal changes and these are permanent changes which occur in the DNA. So abnormal permanent changes in the DNA is going to be called as the mutation and these mutations can be either a point mutation or a frame shift mutation. Point mutation as the name suggests, it is going to be present at a single point. That is a single nucleotide is going to be changed. So these point mutations can either be a silent mutation or a missense mutation or a nonsense mutation. So silent mutation is one in which a uh, nucleotide has changed. So if one nucleotide has changed, but still it is going to code for the same amino acid. In that, in that case, so there is no uh, uh, phenotypic alterations in this case. So that is called as a silent mutation. So in a missense mutation, if you see a single nucleotide change is going to alter the amino acid. The best example for, for this will be a sickle cell anemia. And sickle cell anemia, we all are familiar with here actually at the sixth position of the beta chain of hemoglobin, glutamate is going to be replaced by the valine amino acid. So valin is replacing glutamate at the sixth chain of beta chain, a uh, sixth position of beta chain of uh, hemoglobin. So in that case, valin uh, initially when he, uh, glutamate was present, it was HBA. But when valin replaces, it has led to the formation of HBS, which is going to lead to the phenotypic alterations in the patient, right? So it is causing the disease here. It's going to express the trait. So this is kind of an altered expression because of the change in amino acid is called as a missense mutation. Then a nonsense mutation. Nonsense mutation will result when there is a uh, stop codon being introduced. So when there is a stop codon is being introduced because of the change in one of the nucleotides, then it is going to cause a nonsense mutation. The best example here will be a thalassemia. So thalassemia, usually the mutations happen in non-coding regions. While in sickle cell anemia, it usually happens in the coding regions. So non uh, stop code on examples will be UAG, UGA and UAA. Okay. So suppose there was this UGG sequence. So UGG sequence, I am going with this because of a single uh, point mutation, it is going to be becoming UGA. So in that case, a stop codon has formed, meaning premature termination of the protein has uh, occurred. That is going to result in a nonsense kind of a mutation. Nonsense protein is formed. Next is a frame shift mutation. So frame shift mutation occurs when there is going to be deletion or insertion. So when I am going to insert or delete a nucleotide, the entire sequence of the uh, uh, DNA sequence itself is going to be altered. So let's see an example like this. So this was the sequence. 
So now I am going to add a G over here. Initially, it was going to be read as UAA, UC, ACG and so on. So this will be the triplet which I was reading. But now that I have introduced this new amino, new nucleotide inside, the amino acid sequence will be read as UAA, then GAC, then GA, so on. So this entire sequence of amino acid sequence of uh, reading frame of the sequence itself has been altered. That is resulting in a frame shift kind of a mutation. Okay. So now we have seen about the important terms. Next, see about the classification of genetic diseases. So we have Mendelian disorders, non-Mendelian disorders, chromosomal disorders and polygenic uh, type of inheritance. So Mendelian disorders are the ones which are going to form the, uh, uh, follow the Mendelian laws of inheritance. So under that we have autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-linked recessive, X-linked dominant and Y-linked inheritance. Under non-Mendelian inheritance, here like Mendelian inheritance, these are also single gene disorders only. So both non-Mendelian and uh, Mendelian disorders are single gene disorders. Meaning a single gene is going to be mutated, but they do not form uh, follow the classical pattern of Mendelian inheritance. So classical loss of Mendelian inheritance are not be followed by the non-Mendelian disorders. So examples of these would be the trinucleotide repeat mutations, mitochondrial inheritance or genomic imprinting or even the quinidine mosaicism. So these four are non-Mendelian disorders. Then in the chromosomal disorders, the chromosome number can be defective or altered or it could be the structure of the chromosome which is going to be altered. So in the number of the numerical uh, disorder of the chromosome, it could either affect the uh, autosomes or the sex chromosome. So based on that, we will be studying again. Then structural defects, again we have various types of structural defects in the chromosome. Polygenic inheritance is as such a multifactorial inheritance. Meaning, it is going to have both genetic uh, pattern and also in along with that, environmental factors are going to uh, affect the pattern of inheritance. Many diseases fall under this polygenic inheritance. So, examples of this polygenic inheritance would be diabetes mellitus, hypertension, then we have cleft palate, cleft lip, then we have congenital heart disease. So, all of these are examples of this polygenic inheritance. So, each, each of these diseases will be reading in detail. So starting with the Mendelian disorders, let's see in the next video. So thanks for listening. If you like my content, consider subscribing and sharing it to your friends who might also benefit from my videos. Thank you once again.